seven seals and I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals. A seal there is the roll, right? And there's a, a wax seal on it. Only certain people that were maybe written to a king, for example, only the king could break the seal. No one else could break the seal. If it was broken, we know that the information was compromised. And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth this echoes idolatry in our text of the Ten Commandments. Under the earth was able to open the scroll or look into it. Listen to John's humanity. Then I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Stop weeping. Behold, the lion from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome and so is able to open the book and its seven seals. And I saw between the throne and the elders, a lamb standing, as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, and seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he came and took the book to the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the lamb, each one of them with a harp and a golden bowl full of incense, which, would, which were the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. Worthy are you to take the book 
and to break its seals. It's good. That's our Lord. He is the one who's worthy. None other. Amen. None other. That wasn't our text. That wasn't my plan. I just felt the Spirit. There wasn't any whispering. It just <laughs> felt inclined to do that. Our text, though, is Exodus 20. Before we get there, a quote from Steve Jobs, the famous Apple guy, no longer on this planet, said, some people say give customers what they want, but that's not my approach. Our job is to figure out what they're going to want before they want it. I think Henry Ford once said, if I'd asked my customers what they wanted, they would have told me a faster horse. People don't know what they want until you show it to them. That's why I never rely on market research. Our task is to read things that are not yet on the page, end quote. So Steve Jobs, brilliant man. Of course, he invented Macintosh way back when, right when I was a small child, um, back in the 80s. And then, of course, went through the 90s, and then we have the iPod, and then, of course, the iPhone. He died a number of years ago now, but Apple is what it is because of Steve Jobs. The man was out and out a genius. And despite not ever having biblical faith, we can still rest on God's providence and his common grace, as it's called, to people like Jobs, and we can learn from him. But one thing that stuck out, and I've heard that quote before, which is why I wanted to use it, people don't know what they want until we show it to them. I found an article, and she was kind of talking about it, but it had nothing to do with what I was going to say, so I didn't even bother citing it. But she said, people misunderstand this quote. And I thought, okay, well, let's, let's look at this misunderstanding. Maybe it's what I'm going to talk about, but it wasn't. We do want stuff, but we often don't know what we want until we see it. But we didn't realize we wanted it until we saw it, right? The grass is always greener, as it were. Materialism, not the everything from nothing evolutionary idea. That's also called materialism. There's also stuff, materialism, physical stuff, right? Buying clothes and cars and gadgets and new Legos and movies and trips and everything else. Going and doing and grabbing. That's also materialism or saying that person's materialistic. Grass is greener, right? We will look at the last commandment of our 10-week series. In the honor of God's word, if you wouldn't mind standing as I read and pray, I'm going to start in verse 13 through our text 17. Exodus 20. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, his male or female servant, his, do uh, his ox or his donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. God, thank you for your text. Thank you again that you are clear, you are consistent, you are the God who upholds all things, and you dwell with us despite our brokenness, despite our failure, despite living up to this standard. But even from young ages, we, we haven't. No one has, except for Christ. Help us to see Jesus now. Help us to know that coveting is still wrong, as is murder and adultery and idolatry and having other gods not resting in you and all the others, Lord, but ultimately help us to remember, if anything, from this text, from this series, that righteousness does not come by the works of the law. We cannot keep your law, and even if we could, it doesn't make us righteous. Through your Spirit, dwell with us. Help us to remember this, Lord, in our days, in our trials, in our frustrations. Be with us now, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Envy and coveting are often synonymous, and you'll hear them used more or less the same way. Um, and it's like they are and they're not. I've understood them slightly different, and I've heard other people say it too. Uh, envy from the dictionary is pain or an uneasiness or a discontent, excited, brought up, by the sight of another's superiority or success, accompanied with some degree of hatred or malice, and often usually with the desire <coughs> or effort to appreciate, depreciate the person. Envy springs from pride, ambition, or love, mortified that another has obtained what one has a strong desire to possess. 
kind of longer definition. Covet, on the other hand, same dictionary, to the desire or wish for with eagerness to earnestly obtain or possess. A desire inordinately to desire. The, to desire inordinately to desire. <laughs> that which unlawfully would be obtained or possessed. So coveting seems to also have theft involved. Envy kind of seems to do that, but those are both from the Webster's Dictionary, 1828. Uh, I like old books. Uh, they don't change the definitions as much. But coveting is, is seems kind of like another step, whereas like Envy's like, ah, I really like Glenn's truck. I really, really want a truck. And I'm now, well, he's got a, well, multiple vehicles, but I was actually thinking Jeep. Anyway, I like Glenn's Jeep. I want a Jeep. And Envy would be like, I want a Jeep too. Not that I want to steal Glenn's Jeep, so he doesn't have a Jeep and now I do, but rather just, you know, he can keep his Jeep, but I want a Jeep, but maybe, maybe a better Jeep. But it's, he can keep his Jeep. Whereas coveting is, you're seeking out that person's, that, that person's thing, or in this case, ox or donkey or servant or wife, and taking it from that person. So you're not only getting it, but they're also losing it. So it's kind of this next level, envy. I would say that's why the Lord uses coveting here and not envy. But we see them both used in the text of Scripture. <clears throat> A couple of text quotes, and I do have my books that I use. If you want to borrow them, I'm done. <laughs> so if you want to, just let me know. There's four in the back there. Um, I put them out a few weeks back. Take one, just let me know. They're helpful. Um, probably the best one I used was, well, I won't say. I won't influence anybody. But there's four there, and then I had a fifth one, if you're taking notes, by Mark Rooker. It was a digital book, Mark Rooker, and that's just the Ten Commandments. That was really helpful, too. That one had a little bit more of the language behind it, um, the original languages and stuff. But they were all very good and helpful in different ways, grabbing quotes and just helping me understand and thus helping you hopefully understand what the Ten Commandments were, what they are, how they function, and so on. J.M. Packer, one of the books, states, this is God's searchlight, speaking of this commandment. It moves from our actions and attitudes, from our motions to motives, from forbidden deeds to forbidden desire. Alistair Begg says, we expose ourselves to all sorts of silly and wicked desires that are quite capable of utterly ruining and destroying our souls. The desire for wealth is founded in the illusion that it brings security. Ironically, it brings anxiety. And Mark Rooker states, this last commandment could therefore be viewed as interpreting clause of the whole Decalogue. And that much is true. Because you might look at it and you think, like, why is this here? Right? we got the four with God, maybe fifth one, kind of that bridge between God and you obey your parents, honor your parents, and you're kind of obeying and honoring God. Okay, so that's you know, one, two, three, four, and then five, parents, and then six, murder, the most severe, and then adultery, seven, stealing, lying, and here we are. But all those have to do with actions. Like, I'm taking my thing, I'm grabbing the thing, I'm lying to you physically, I'm doing these things. Now, Jesus transforms both you know, adultery, right, with looking with lust, and the murder, six and seven. But in one sense, this one kind of examines and looks back at the other nine. It is quite helpful in many ways because it's ultimately getting to the heart. Because that's what God has always been concerned with. It's never been about law in the Old Testament. Well, I'm glad we don't live in the Old Testament anymore because we had to keep the law to be righteous. Nope, wrong, eh. But I read early on, that there were some early people, maybe a hundred years or so ago, I think it was, that basically taught that. So it didn't come out of thin air, but people misunderstanding the text of Scripture and having a certain view of the Scripture, they wanted to have a right view, right? They weren't left as crazy liberals or anything. They were wanting to honor God. They were wanting to understand the text. But they had other presuppositions that led them to that, mainly dividing Israel and the rest of the world and thinking Israel was still kind of, you know, glorified and saved in a particular way, un apart, uh, set apart from Christ. And many people still have that view somewhat today. But this last commandment tells us as a searchlight, right? As Packer says, and it, it, as Rooker calls it, kind of like an interpretation for the rest of the Decalogue. Decalogue, of course, deca meaning. Ten and log, like dialogue, it's just ten words. 
So unlike last week where we saw there were instances with the Hebrew midwives or Rahab or others that were actually honoring God by lying because they were upholding and fearing the Lord, Exodus 1, if you're interested, was the Hebrew midwives, for example, there are no instances of coveting being seen as good, which I guess is good, right? We don't, and it's a little bit more specific than the others. Sometimes you'll see the Ten Commandments and it'll just say, you shall not covet, thou shalt not, right? KJV. And then that's it. We, we get the understanding of it. But this isn't limited to, and say, well, I don't have a donkey or a ox, so I guess I can covet my neighbor's new car, right? Or his house or her job. I mean, you know, she's got a great job. She barely does anything and gets paid six figures. No, that's still included. This is just the practical nature right now, talking to Israel. But just because you don't really care about donkeys or oxen, doesn't mean you, you can't not covet. <clears throat> he tells us, as the last instance, Moses here, you shall not covet. And we can see, outwardly, there's many instances, it would you know, we'd be here all afternoon, which may not be a bad thing, but we won't be. I want to go eat lunch. Many, many times the coveting was bad, right? It either went bad for the person involved or people on the periphery. Last week we looked at 1 Kings 21 with Naboth, right? He had the nice plush land, the rich, juicy grapes, and the this and the that. Nice land near Ahab's palace, the king. And of course, Jezebel, we've heard that, a woman's a wicked Jezebel, blah, blah, blah. Both wicked people, they met a very terrible end in this life, and certainly destruction in the next. But he didn't just steal, right, and didn't just lie, but he also coveted first, right? He saw the land, and he did go to Naboth and say, hey, man, why don't you, I'm the king, why don't you sell me that sweet land? It's good stuff. Naboth's like, no, I'm good, thanks, man, I appreciate it, though. King, whatever, your highness, have a nice day. And of course, then he gets killed. Jezebel lies, holds a party in Naboth's honor, has two worthless men, the text say, lie about him, and then two witnesses, they can stone him. Second Samuel 11, David, David and Bathsheba, we know that well. What did he do? He wasn't where he was supposed to be with the kings out to war, as if they had like a season, like baseball or football, I don't know, warring season. But he wasn't what he was supposed to be doing, and he's meandering around on his roof, minding his own business, quote unquote. And I've actually been there, um, where the temple or the uh, palace was, not there anymore. But there's a, ra a ravine, and so there's houses, and there's still houses even today in uh, Jerusalem on the other side. So you can see right over. You know, it's not like, and there's flat roofs, not like our roofs, right? No air conditioning, usually not many windows. So. How's the story go? Bathsheba, she's bathing, minding her own business, and then the king summons her. But what does he do? What gets him going on that? Oh, she's nice. I'm going to covet, right? Not just, oh, she's nice. I'm going to go get a different woman. No, I'm going to get that woman. Then, of course, we know a baby happens, and the murder of Uriah, her husband, lying, on and on and on. A little lesser known one. Turn over to Joshua 7, verse 1. Joshua 7, 1. But the sons of Israel acted unfaithfully in regard to the things under the ban. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, from the tribe of Judah, took some of the things under the ban. Therefore, the anger of the Lord burned against the sons of Israel. So notice, so oftentimes, in the text of Scripture, we see people, uh, and then we have, you know, unbelievers around us, or skeptics online, or maybe a friend, or whatever, and they say, well, God's just unjust, or this, or that. He's mean. He kills people unlawfully, or he does these other things. But it's always provoked, to use the term, nearly always provoked, from humanity. What does Achan do? It doesn't say God's just striking Achan down because he actually gets stoned later in the chapter. We'll read in a moment. There's a ban, and they say destroy these people because they're wicked, because they're worshiping false gods, and we can get into that another time. 
But the point is, they're at AI, AI, not really how you pronounce it, the, the city, and they go and they can seize a few things and says, ah, I'll just take a few things. But God says, don't take anything. So who are we going to believe? Who are we going to trust? Our own God or the Lord? It's pretty straightforward. A lot of people will say, well, I just want God to be clear. I want God to speak to me. What about God's will? What about this? What about that? And yet we have it here. And especially in text, those same people who might mock at a situation like this where Achan gets killed, quote unquote, unlawfully, when it's completely lawful, are the same people that say, well, God's vague, or he's not clear, or he's this or he's that. It's like, that's not true at all. There was a ban, don't take this, and this is what happened. Oh, you took it, well, destruction for you. But in verse 20, if you drop down, so Achan answered Joshua after they get the third degree and things are happening. Truly, I have sinned against the Lord and the God of Israel. And this is what I did. And he tells what he did. 24, then Joshua and all Israel took Achan, the son of Zerai, the silver and the mantle, the bar of gold, and his sons and daughters, and his sheep, and all that belonged to them. And they brought them out of the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, why have you troubled us? The Lord will trouble you this day. And all Israel stoned them with stones. Now that's so hard and weird to our modern 21st century American eyes or ears. And it's no less heinous when we sin against the Lord. But just because we don't see it happening, and I'm not advocating stoning, <laughs> not, please, but at the same time, when we have a low view of sin, we have a low view of God. And then we continue wandering in that, thinking, ah, it's no big deal. I mean, I've seen atheists do presentations and mock God and have him, desire him to strike them down on the stage. Could he? Of course he could. But how foolish is it for people to do that? Especially people who say they don't even believe in God. But I guess they're proving some points. But their knee will bow one day. The point is here with Achan, he coveted, and it didn't go well with him or his household. Especially in ancient Near Eastern cultures, and most cultures around the world still, it's not just this hyper-individualistic thing like we have in the West, especially in America. If I do something, my wife is still part of that. My children are often still part of that, and even my parents and so on, because you're a unit. We're built for community and relationship, not just individual people. And that's why we hear this a lot of times, and even if we're saying, yeah, amen, I get it, God's holy, I'm a sinner, it still kind of rubs us, it's still kind of like sandpaper, and we're like, oh, I don't know. But let's be thankful that that doesn't always happen, number one. And we can also look at other examples where the Lord is gracious, like the woman caught in adultery. And what was the punishment for that but stoning? And there's men there, however they saw her and whatever was going on, Jesus says, fine, stone her, but you can stone her first if you don't have any sin. And of course, the older guys leave, and the middle-aged guys, and the young guys, and then it's just her and Jesus. And what does he say? Oh, yeah, it's fine. I'm not going to condemn you. Have a nice day. He doesn't say all. He says more, right? He says, what? I don't condemn you either. Go and sin no more. So there's this repentance, this turning of, don't do that anymore. Not just a matter of like, well, you're fine. People who like to say they're Christians but aren't and don't believe the scripture modernly will say and use that text and act as though Jesus is totally fine with adultery. No, he was being merciful and not condemning and stoning that woman. James 1.14 And remember when you're being tempted, do not say, and I just read this, this is from the New Living Translation, so it's slightly different. Do not say, I'm being, God is tempting me. God is never tempted to do wrong, and he does not tempt anyone. Temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions, and when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. So there's this chain, this pattern, this, this domino effect of sequence that goes along. We've seen those videos with the big giant domino set in like big warehouse, right? And they just do the one and it goes this and all this crazy stuff and different colors and lights and everything else. It's pretty cool. But that one little domino knocks everything else over, right? 
And that's how often it is with sin. But it's not God who's demanding us to live up to some expectation which we cannot actually meet. He's made a way, right? Remember, the scripture is all about a real God dealing with real people, just like you and just like me. Not just super saints of old. We just saw it, Achan, right? We saw the woman at the well, or the woman in adultery, or the woman at the well, right? She had five husbands. It wasn't really what you're supposed to do. But this is why we must study this book and why we must have it even for today. It speaks to us even now. It's not some old dead book. But rather it's alive and active because our God, the God of reality, is a living God. Romans 7, 9 diagnoses this well. Paul writes, you can flip there if you want, a few verses, 7, 7. <clears throat> What shall we say then? Is the law sin? By no means. Yet, if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin, for I would not have known what it was to covet if the law had said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive, and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it killed me. Hyperbolically, of course. Verse 12, so the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. So coveting, we see Paul's not even really talking about any actual actions that are happening, right? Simply, don't covet. It's, it's motives within, as whoever it was I said a moment ago. Packer, I think. The motives, motions, doing things to internally motives. But this is why we need Christ. Right? This is, this is precisely why we need Jesus. Why everyone, you, me, and everyone we know, who's ever lived or ever will live, needs the Messiah. Needs redemption. And the redemption doesn't come through keeping the law. Many people think that. Many people still think that. Most people think that. Even if you're in some sort of make-it-your-way sort of religion where it's, you know, disorganized. People say, I don't like organized religion. It's like, well, you like disorganized religion, I guess. Like, everybody's religious. Everybody has a worldview. Everybody has an idea about the past, the present, and the future. Everybody. Even the most die-hard atheists. We read earlier in Sunday school. Seth was talking about Richard Dawkins and how it's evil and this and that, and Christians passing on their heritage to their children and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, you have zero, you don't even have, you have less than zero as far as a foundation to stand on to call anything evil. When you neglect and ignore and hate God, you don't have a foundation. Because, well, he says, well, it's my foundation. Well, who are you? I don't need to listen to you. You're just some guy with an accent. I don't care. Why should anyone listen to you? Because you have a PhD? Well, there's other PhDs that disagree with you. What now? It doesn't work. When you erode and or remove the foundation of God's word and his holy law and gospel, it's just a game. It's a never-ending treadmill of who said what and when and how and everything else. An illustration for a moment for the coveting is like when you're on a diet or you're trying to avoid sweets, right? Maybe you've kicked coffee before. I probably should do that personally, but, you know, I like it so much. What do you want to do? Say you, you drink coffee, right? I know some of us don't drink coffee. That's okay. Whatever you drink instead of coffee. And you're not going to do that tomorrow or the next day or the, for a few weeks. What are you going to want? Mid-afternoon, you're like, oh, man, where'd my coffee go? I really would like coffee. Let's just have, I'll just have a little. Right? Like instantly we can't have it now. We want it even more. Or like the little boy that's playing and there's a red ball over in the corner. Just there, hanging out. He's got his trains. This isn't anybody in particular. I'm just, you know, hypothetically. And other children are there, maybe his sisters. And all of a sudden, somebody shows up and plays with that red ball. And he's like, hey, my red ball. And you're like, you weren't even playing with this red ball. It's like, well, yeah, I, well, I am now. I wanted to. Well, you weren't playing with it, though. Why are you yelling? Why are you hurting your sister? Well, because I'm coveting, Father. That's why. Usually, that's what he says. 
<laughs> hypothetically, hypothetically. <laughs> but that's exactly right. We, we, until it's something there, we're like, oh, oh, what's that? Oh, you want that? Oh, I want that too. And we do it as adults, right? It's not just children, unfortunately. We don't, it's one of those things we just don't grow out of. Nobody wants that thing, that whatever, and then all of a sudden other people want it. You're like, ah, oh, why do they want that? I want that too. In fact, I don't even want you to have it. I want it all for me. It's humorous because we know it's true, right? But that's coveting. But even if we don't do it, if we never covet again, and we're never, and we keep all the commandments right now, one through ten. It's not that many, really. I mean, it's only ten. We're still not righteous, right? Because first of all, what about all our sin we didn't do? But even if we were able to do that from birth, or before that, in in the womb, which I don't really know how that would work. But anyway, say we're perfect. That's just the expectation. Right? The speed limit on the road is 70 or 65 or whatever it is. As I said, I think it was last week or the week before, the cop's not going to pull you over, police officer, uh, and say, hey, by the way, you're such a great driver. I love you so much. Here's a gift card. Right? He's not going to do that. She's not going to do that. They might say, hey, I like your truck or, you know, oh, hey, so-and-so or tell your mom hi or whatever if you know them. But you're not going to get something in addition to not getting a ticket. Worse still, if you're going 75 or 80 in a 70 or 55, he has every right to write you a ticket. So it's merciful to not write you a ticket because we've all been let off, let's be honest. Uh, <laughs> but then you're like, okay, that's mercy. Praise God. Thank you. Thank you. I don't need that on my, on my record. Thank you. But then, he, say he does give you an Amazon gift card for $500. You're like, I mean, if that really happened, you would be blown away. You not only would be, you, first you'd say it's a trick. Like, what, are you, what is this? And then you check, maybe on your phone, you get home on your computer, and you're like, this is real. Like, why did he give me a gift card? Just because he loves me so much. And it's like, uh, okay. But then what would you do? You wouldn't hide that. You would tell your friends. you say, it's unbelievable. I was speeding. I deserved a ticket. He said, no, don't worry about it. You're such a great driver overall. And, you know, even though you're kind of not the best all the time, I'm actually also going to give you a gift card. <laughs> like, that's mercy and that's grace. And I know it's an analogy. And, and obviously it gets, you know, played out. And God's grace in Christ is so much bigger. But that's basically what it is. You get the forgiveness. And it's like, great, I'm, I'm not destroyed. Great, now I'm at zero. But God doesn't dwell at zero. Holiness isn't at zero. He is in the stratosphere. He is, he's righteous, thrice holy, right? But if we want to dwell with our Creator, we have to be holy. And we can't make it. Even if we're erased and everything, the blackboard's totally clean. There's no content there. There's no holiness there. So we still have a problem. That's why we need Jesus. That's why we need Jesus. Because the law never gives righteousness. Galatians 3.10 For by the works of the law, those who are under a curse. For it is written, curses is everyone who does not abide by the things written in the law. So you're already cursed if you don't do the law. Right? And we're all sinners. We've all fallen short. But then it says in 3.11 Now that no one is justified by the law before God is evident. Righteousness. The righteous one will live by and it's not faith in faith. It's not faith in some nebulous thing. But it's faith that has a substance. Faith that is a person. 12 and 3, chapter 3 there. However, the law is not a faith. On the contrary, the person who performs them will live by them. Christ redeemed us. And this, oh, this is so good. This is so good. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. If that doesn't make you rejoice, if you don't leap in your soul, ask yourself why. And if you do leap in your soul, but the week and the month drags you down, your children, grandchildren, life, work, whatever, the junk in the world, we need to be reminded of this. That's why we meet weekly. That's why we need to read the text and pray daily. 
Not to keep the law so God doesn't strike us down because he's an angry, cranky grandpa God who doesn't like us if we don't do all these things. No, he's your heavenly father who wants to give blessing and wants to give abundant grace and mercy to us repeatedly over again that will never run dry, ever. And so often we're so satisfied, as C.S. Lewis calls it, we have a holiday at the beach just waiting for us, an amazing resort of everything there. And we're like, yeah, that's fine. I'm just going to sit in the backyard and play with mud pies. That's what we're satisfied with, Lewis says. Like a little child. Not to diminish children, but oftentimes you give them, you know, a piece of filet mignon, three-year-old, she's going to be like, eh, I don't really care. Lobster, right? A good book. They're, they don't appreciate it. They don't see it. But Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. He swapped it out. Not that we have to become a curse as well or, you know, get crucified ourselves. But rather, he took our punishment on the tree. He took our penalty. And this is the gospel. Too often in our culture, especially in church culture, people will say it's a gospel issue. This thing or that thing, it's a gospel issue. Or we hear about gospel music, or, oh, that's a gospel whatever. A gospel tract, maybe. Or, you know, it's, oh, he, he takes that information just like it's gospel. You know, we have it in our vernacular. But the gospel ultimately is, as we see from Places like Romans 1, it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes. There is a contingency of belief, which is paired with faith and looking at that one who is the author and perfecter of our faith. And not just Americans, right? Not just men or, or, or older people or younger people or people with light skin or darker skin or people who only speak English or Spanish or Russian. No, every single person from every tribe, tongue, and nation that we read or sang in a moment ago. And it's not just some guy singing some song. He gets this from Revelation. It's redemption. We have a problem. God has the solution. And that is the gospel through Christ. Not your good works. And I know I say this, but we need to have it constantly repeated. Because I don't know about you, I need it reminded all the time. Because so often we believe the lie that's just floating out there. And I didn't say it last time when we did lying a couple weeks ago. But I think it was like Mark Twain, right? Where the whole lie in the shoe, I forget how the phrase goes. I'm just spitballing here. But, you know, the, the, between the lie and the truth, before the truth gets its shoes on, the lie, a lie has already made its way halfway around the world. Right? I've heard that phrase. I think it was Mark Twain originally who said it. But that's true. And how often do we see that in media routinely? This thing happens, and instantly all this stuff. And then it comes out, oh, actually, that wasn't at all what happened. And it's like, no, nah, I don't care. We're going to still go with the first story. It's like, but that's a lie. Nah, that doesn't really matter. It, it, it's better for clicks. It's better for ratings. <laughs> but lying, we believe it so often, even unknowingly. Which is why we have to constantly have the truth be reminded to us. Because we live in a broken system. The world is fallen. And we have an enemy. We don't have a passive enemy. We have one who roams around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Roaring lions are hungry lions. Early in Genesis, it talks about sin crouching at the door. This is God directly to Cain who just murdered his brother. Sin is looking for an opportunity, and Paul talks about it in Romans 7. Seizing an opportunity. But ultimately, that sin comes from within. Right? It's outside, and we can either reject it or embrace it, believe the lie, or speak the truth in love. But people are sinners. You're a sinner, and I'm a sinner. We've all fallen short. 
And that idea, I've said it before, missing the target is sin, like the archery term, right? You've missed the target, it's not a bullseye, you've sinned. That's the term. Sin, actually, in Spanish means without, so kind of same idea. But it's not just English. Of course, it's the idea of missing it. You're lacking. We're lacking. And did Jesus miss it? No, he did not. That's why people attack him. That's why people constantly mock and ridicule Jesus. That's why people, everybody around the world has some form of Jesus. And so often it's the wrong one because it's not derived from Scripture. Even people who claim to be Christians. But then they take all the things that Jesus says and turn them on their head. Or they pretend he said all these other things and then ignore the things he did say. And tell his disciples, his followers. Romans 1.17 For the gospel reveals the righteousness of God that comes by faith from start to finish, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. We've already talked about that. So it's ultimately about our heart. It starts there. This tenth commandment, examining the other nine. All the other things that we know. Romans 3.20 Therefore, no one will be justified in his sight, that is God's sight, by the works of the law. For the law merely brings awareness of sin. If that's not a passage to memorize, and it's still kind of like, oh, I don't know, what the, I mean, what's, the, what's, I've still kind of missed it. What are, what are you talking about? Like, what do you, what's the Ten Commandments? Like, why do we need to do this again? And should we read them? Should we, should we keep them or don't? Do, so it's not righteousness, like, so I just ignore them. We do have our sermons online. The audio is on the website, newharvest.org. And then uh, the video uh, from, I think, the third week onward is on YouTube as well. But Romans 3.20, Therefore no one will be justified by his sight by the works of the law, for the law merely brings awareness of sin. Merely brings an awareness of sin. Galatians 2.16, Know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Notice this, it's either or, right? And he has to constantly say this. Why? Because these people were struggling with that then. So you're saying, wait, hold on, that I don't get justified by the law? Are you sure? Because it feels like I should, <laughs> right? That's probably what they were thinking and saying. And I know some of us, maybe all of us, have thought that at one point. Are you sure, though? Because I really want to work for it. Because if I work for it, then it makes me, you know, part savior. And, you know, it feels a little better. Whatever the reason is. But this is why some of the reason why people don't accept Christ they reject it because they want a piece of the action. They want to have, you know, co-saviorness, even if it's only 1%. But that's folly. That's stupid. Don't do that. Don't think that way. Seriously. Because you can't make it anyway. Even if you do think that and you try it, it ain't going to work. Acts 13, 39. Through him, everyone who believes is justified from everything you could not be justified from the law of Moses. And that justification, justified, probably bears without uh, saying, but regardless, you're, you're justified, meaning you're not guilty. That's simply what it means. You're good. You're good. You're, we're good. Wiped away. You're justified. Through him, who everyone who believes in him, that's Acts 13, 39. I mean, that's another fact. It's so clear. You can't be justified by the law, by keeping the law. It's just, that's the expectation. Drive 70 on the highway. That's what it is. Nobody's going to give you a gift card. Nobody's going to do anything. They're just, great, you didn't get a ticket. Well, that's what you're supposed to do. Don't kill people. You have to, that's what you're not, you're not supposed to do that. You're not going to be like, well, good job. You didn't kill anybody today, right? You're not going to tell your kill children like, oh, you didn't steal anything. Oh, honey, you're so great. Grandkids, oh, you didn't lie to me? Aw, you love grandma so much, right? Like, don't lie to me. That's the expectation. You did lie to me? Oh, that's it. Now there's discipline, right? That's why we need both the law and the gospel. Because if the gospel, Jesus loves you. Well, yeah. Wait, who's Jesus? Oh, uh, he's, you know, he's a, he's a really good teacher. Okay. Anything else? Nah, that's about it. Well, I mean, he, you know, he died on a cross or something. For what? Uh, uh, I mean, I'm not really sure. Like sin or something, I guess. What's sin? I don't. Uh, he, you just, you just, 
You need, she needed to live your life better. She needed to do better. Your best life now. Just do it. Just, just do that. It's fine. Just try harder. Or the other thing is, you need to do this. Sam, you're not, you're not living up. Debbie, no, you're not doing it. Michael, uh-uh. You're not making the mark. And I could just stand up here all day long, or at least every Sunday, and just berate everybody and pretend like I'm keeping the law, which I'm certainly not. And then neglect to share and proclaim to you and to myself the good news of redemption in Christ. Because that would be stupid. And I guarantee you there are pulpits all over Kentucky that do that very thing. And I'm not bragging. Please don't hear that. But what they're doing is they're halfway doing it. The shiny, cool celebrity churches with the guys with the you know, $400 sneakers and the no pulpit, whatever. Those guys, they're doing the one part, first part. Just, just Jesus. Just love Jesus. He's just great. He's my example or whatever. And then the other people, no, it's the law. You're a sinner. It's both, right? It's both. We need Christ because we're sinners. Well, where did sin come from? Well, look at Genesis 3. God created us perfectly. Here's this one commandment. Live in me and with me in this way. So on and so forth. Adam and Eve had other ideas. That's why Jesus is the second Adam. That's why you take a, a direct, literal approach to the first Adam. How can you have a second Adam if you have a fake, mystical first Adam? And there's Christians, authors, speakers who believe that, which is just stupid. If you don't have a literal first Adam, you don't have a literal second Adam. And then you don't have sin forgiven, and you're still in it. Or as Paul says, we are still dead in our trespasses and sins. And we're of all people most to be pitied. I don't want to be pitied. Do you want to be pitied? You know, people think, oh, you guys are wasting your money, you're wasting your time. Poor, simple-minded Christians. Yeah, we are simple-minded. We're total fools to do what we're doing if Jesus is not risen from the dead. If he isn't who he says he is, both the God-man who took on flesh and dwelt among us, forgiven us all of our trespasses and sins, in which we formerly used to walk, and that we can now walk righteously and holy in him. Not because of the things that we've done. Not because of the bootstrap sort of Christianity, I'm going to do half and Jesus is going to do half, he's my co-pilot, whatever. No. Rather, because all of Christ... Simply all of him for his glory and our good, though we don't deserve it. That's why we need both the law and the gospel. Step one and step two. Flip over to First Timothy for a moment. Chapter six. Six, three. If anyone advocates a different doctrine that does not agree with sound words, those of our Lord Jesus Christ and with the doctrine conforming to godliness, he is conceited and understands nothing. But he has a morbid interest in controversial questions and disputes about words, which arise, out of which arise envy, strife, abusive language, evil suspicions, and constant friction between men deprived of, deprived of deprived mind deprived of the truth, and suppose godliness is a means of gain. We know we shouldn't covet. We know we shouldn't love this world. But it's just like all the other commandments, there's a positive side to it as well. Don't have any other gods before me. Worship God. That's the first one, right? We saw that. And then that kind of filters down through all the others. And so often we're breaking that one when we're breaking the other ones too, because there's, just like James tells us, we've broken one part, we've broken all of it. Colossians 4, flip over there too. We're going to look at these last two passages and we'll, we'll close out. But there's instances, because the Bible is real, with real people, that really speaks to us even now. Paul writing to the Colossian church, Verse 2, devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert with an attitude of thanksgiving. Verse 5, conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of your time. 
Let your speech season with, be seasoned with grace, or with salt, uh, with grace as though seasoned with salt. Then he says, seven. To all my fairest Tychicus, our beloved brother. He taught, he named several people. Verse eight, he says, for I have sent him to you for this very purpose. Verse nine, and with Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of your number. Aristarchus, verse 10, my fellow prisoner, greets you as does Barnabas, Mark's cousin. Barnabas's cousin, Mark, excuse me. 11, Jesus, who is also called Justice. Verse 12, Epaphras, who is one of your number, a bond slave of Jesus Christ. Verse 14, Luke, our author of Acts and, of course, the Gospel. The beloved physician sends you his greetings and also Demas. And then 15, the brethren of Laodicea and Nympha, the church in her house, Archippus, take heed for the ministry that you have received, verse 17, and so on. Paul is mentioning several people, right? And these men and women who are lovely, wonderful saints, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Reminding the Colossian church to pray for them, to be thankful for them. But sadly, turn over to 2 Timothy 4, verse 10. Mm, verse 8. 7, sorry, 7. I have fought the good fight, and I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. This is Paul's last letter he's writing. He's very old. He's, most people believe he's about to be executed. He's in a Roman prison right now writing. In the future is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. Not only me, to all those who have loved his appearing. Notice that. Do you love Jesus' appearing? Not physically seeing him, not a vision. That's what I'm talking about. I'm saying Christ coming into the world to save sinners. The one God who loved the world who sent his son. That appearing. Or is it cowering? Oh, I'm going to be found out I'm a fraud. Oh, I'm a liar. Uh, or, or you know you're there and you don't think he can forgive. Trust me, he can forgive. If you're in that spot, either in here, people listening, or in the future, whenever that may be, listening again, and you think you've sinned more than God's grace, you are sorely, sorely mistaken. No sin is big enough to quash God's grace. Amen. Gets overwhelmed by His mercy and love. But you have to ask, you have to turn and acknowledge what He already knows. He already sees it. He already knows deep down to the dregs that we can't even see. All the way down into our heart. He already sees it. Just tell him about it. Repent of it. Whatever you're holding on to, if you're holding on, it's not worth it. Back to Timothy. Verse 9. Make every effort to come to me soon. Verse 10. For Demas, having loved this present world and deserted me, has gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia and Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me, he says in 11. But I thought Demas was, well, he was, past tense. He was with Paul. He was there. But what does it say? He didn't, Titus didn't abandon him. He neither, neither did Crescens. They just left and had other missions and things and callings to do. But what does he say about Demas? Having loved this present world. And that's not the same world that God so loved the world. That's a different world. That's cosmos or cosmos. This is age, or aeon, if you want to get fancy with the Greek. Age. Demas loved this present culture. Demas loved all the little goodies that you get. All the accolades of men. All the stuff he can buy. The food. The entertainment. The likes. On Instagram or Facebook, Twitter, whatever. The praises of men and women. Demas liked this whole system. Now, maybe he repented, I don't know. But right now, he says he didn't. And he's deserted me and in love with this present world. Why? Because of covetousness. Because it seized an opportunity, took him, and killed him. And instead of him realizing it, like Paul did, and he says in Romans 7, perhaps he was destroyed by it. Maybe he repented. Hopefully he did. But we don't know. But that should be... 
Nothing short of a warning to us who, someone who is with Paul, seeing miracles, seeing God's hand move, knowing that there's something happening, that the living God is changing people's hearts and minds. And that guy sees it, and he says, nah, forget this, I'm, I'm going to Thessalonica. I'm going to Vegas. I'm going to Miami, New York, forget this place. Kentucky, we're done. It's been fun. Not, you, not that if you move there, right? Doesn't mean everybody's apostate. But if you love this present situation we're in, I don't know why you would, but if you do, and you're looking at only what you can see and not the faith of the things unseen, which is the living God, you will be destroyed. And this is one of those evidences of that. It is possible. We saw the prodigal son in the Gospels. That has a happier ending, of course, we know that. He comes to his senses and he comes back to his father. But let's not, let's not forget that's why we're told to walk by faith and not by sight. Why we're called to put on the full armor of God. Not just the sword or the shield or the helmet, but the whole thing. The belt of truth. The breastplate of righteousness and so on. Not just a matter of like piecemeal sort of couch potato, I guess. You know, I'm saved, so I'm good. I got baptized, whatever, we're done. No, walking in a manner worthy of our calling. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, so we don't have to worry about keeping the law. Now, we should still keep these things at minimum because it's just for civil order. We don't want people going around murdering and stealing and lying to each other. But further still, Jesus actually fulfills all these things, and ultimately that Sabbath rest is resting in him. That picture of the former things, now the substance, as we see from Hebrews, what? Belongs to who? Christ. Yeah, that's right. I heard somebody say The substance belongs to Christ. It happened in the past, and it's there, and it was real things, and we can look back to that and appreciate it, and then we can look to the cross and know that the substance belongs to Jesus. He is the one who gives new life. So to apply this, then, we must just know that this commandment is not just about not coveting, but rather being satisfied in Christ. Similar to the fourth, where we're resting in him, as that Sabbath, yes, Israel kept the Sabbath, they were supposed to do that, their governmental system. We worship on Sunday because it's the Lord's day when he resurrected, not the Sabbath. We saw that. Confusion, go back and listen. But these commandments overlap each other. And ultimately, they always should be the goal of resting in Jesus. Close with this. Augustine, 5th century church father, said, You have made us for yourself, O Lord. And your heart, our heart, is restless until it finds its rest in you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your spirit that moves among us, that is unleashed when we open up your word. Those who have eyes to see and ears to hear, who are willing like children to come to the Heavenly Father of reality, the God of light, can see this when we even read the text of Scripture. Some are more vague, some are more confusing, and some are just so pointed and so clear. I pray that you will please help us to apply this knowledge, this, this series, what you've shown us. That these commandments are an expectation. We should still keep them, not because we are under the Levitical law or Israel's monarchy. We are not in the Old Testament era, so-called. But rather we should keep these because of Christ. And because He fulfilled them, we can rest in Him. And His completeness. Help us to not covet, Lord. It's so easy to do. We've all done it so many times. But help us rather to be thankful and rest and dwell in Jesus. Thank you for these people, Lord. Thank you for those who are here. And those who are not, Lord. Dwell with us even now, as only you can. In Jesus' name.